Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the AXR Sales Director Incubator. My name is Mike Dixon. I lead the sales and marketing practice for AXR Recruitment and Search. And today I'm joined by Christy Ryan, Commercial Director for liquor company William Grant & Sons. Uh, Christy, how are you this morning? I'm very well, thank you, Mike. How are you? Yeah, pretty good, thanks. Pretty good. Now, um, I know your business pretty well, being Scottish originally, but... Uh, um, for those perhaps not so close to the liquor sector or Scottish, uh, and maybe a little unfamiliar with William Grant, can you just maybe take a moment to, to plug the business and the amazing brands you've got? I know and love Glenfiddich is one of our, our primary sort of whiskies, Balvenie, uh, Hendrix Gin, Sailor Jerry. So a whole bunch of um, products that play probably in the premium portfolio of the liquor industry. So really, really good business and probably the biggest producer of scotch in the world. Fun fact. Good. That's, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, now, before we jump into your story, I'll take a second too, just to, to plug our podcast for, uh, for those who are listening live. If you don't um, get the chance to jump onto the live sessions on Thursday mornings, everything's available on the podcast, Your Future in Sales and Marketing. Because when today's interview uh, with you, Christy, lands on Spotify and Apple Podcasts next Thursday, will actually be our 30th episode. So we're really proud of that to get to the number 30, which is cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's um, so let's get into it. Now, before we, we kind of talk about your your career and, and, and we get into you know life running the sales function for, for William Grants, we always like to chat a little bit about you know what's going on um, in, in life outside of work. And and uh, we're living obviously in you know pretty bizarre times uh, uh, anywhere you are in the world. But um, and one kind of topic I, I I kind of ask a lot of my friends about is uh, if there's one thing you could change about society you know what would it be topical i might annoy people this morning um but at the moment it would probably be a vaccination rate <laughs> and uh encouraging people to get more vaccinated i'm not a doctor so i won't get into any of the reasons why i think that but uh obviously with covid at the moment and the impact on my industry in particular um accommodation uh all of our small hotels and restaurants and bars I would love to see people uh, take on the vaccine a little bit faster than we are. If it's available, also, that's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, I think we're, 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 we're seem to be suddenly, not suddenly, but I don't know, in the last few weeks getting there, uh, I think people have kind of realised that, um, oh gosh, this is more real than, than perhaps we, we thought last year when we were kind of largely cocooned from it. But uh, um, so maybe we're getting there. But yeah, I'm with you there. If we accelerate that, it would mean that we can start to live normal life again. Wouldn't which it would be, be good. good getting on aeroplanes and going out to beer gardens, you know, we're coming into summer. So yeah, it'd be good to get back to a little bit more sense of normal, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So where, where, where would you go, um, you know, first holiday, post COVID, where, where would you go? Oh, I think about this all the time because every single year I go to Thailand, like I have to go there. It's, it's my holiday destination. And, and what COVID did was made me reflect on the places I haven't been. So yeah. uh, where I haven't been and I really want to go and just in case there's a, a future pandemic, I'd have to get across to um, do a little trip between Japan and then South Korea as well. Right. Yeah, right. really interesting. I love seeing different cultures and uh, certainly amazing food over there, but also two very different cultures that I'd love to experience. Yeah, excellent. Right. Okay. Well, um, hopefully that can happen in the not too distant future. Um, let's get into it. And uh, um, I'm uh, quite happy um, to your previous point, be as controversial as you like as we go through this. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's kind of um, look a bit about you know, your, your career. I'm interested always in people's kind of early stage you know, career um, thinking. When you kind of reflect back and, 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 and look at your career, you know, in, in um, you know, as you've gone and gone through it, is there, is there a point in the earlier part of your career that you thought that's the job that really formed me that, or accelerated me or made me turn me on to the fact that this is what I want to be? Um, I would have to say probably one of the most formative roles would have been my role over in our, what we call in our industry travel retail or global travel retail, so the duty-free sort of market. Uh, it's uh, an area that I wasn't really exposed to before, so it was very different, but these are huge global customers and airports are one of the biggest channels actually to operate within um, in sort of the liquor industry. So going across to a channel I knew nothing about and having to learn that, and you're also 
operate very siloed. I was reporting into Singapore, not Australia, even though I was based in Australia, managing a fair few different markets and managing global customers that, you know, are huge in other markets um, and probably bigger than some of our Australian customers that we work with in our sort of regular FNCG and, and liquor sort of network. So uh, that was a role where I definitely got to learn a lot and experience, you know, just so many different things, whether it was going through distributors in different markets because you couldn't operate there directly, whether it was um, working with German sort of retailers, which were very different to the Australian retailers at the time, or, or going over to Thailand and working within their networks as well. It was just such an eye opener. And um, I learned such a variety of skills and had to change my style a lot for all of those different customers as well. Great. Fantastic. And, and out of interest, what took you into sales to start with? Um, interesting story actually I was a store manager at Dick Smith Electronics um, I'd left McDonald's where I was a manager and went into store management for retail and <laughs> all these I didn't know what they were but reps I guess kept coming in and talking to me about mobile phones and stuff I was like, what is your job like what do you do and I was talking to these reps about what they did and you know they told me they were sales reps and I was like, this sounds really fun. So you get a car and you get paid really well and you only have to work Monday to Friday. And that's something I want to do. And that's sort of how I got into looking for being a rep um, and eventually landed my role at Unilever a few years after that. Um, and yeah, that got me into sales. I always really loved sales. I'm quite competitive. So even working at McDonald's, I'd upsell people uh, or even working at Dick <laughs> Smith, it was like quite a thrill when you sold a laptop or something, you know, an expensive piece of uh, inventory. Um, but yeah, the idea of driving around and just sort of selling I just naturally fell into it so it wasn't something I planned for but yeah definitely definitely those experiences of dealing with those people coming into my store yeah it's a familiar it's a, it's a familiar path actually I've, I've met in this program a few um, retailers originally in their career who got into sales who uh, who, who do talk to a, a similar kind of story looking at those people coming into the store going that's a better job than what I've got <laughs> way better <laughs> <laughs> oh cool um now um is there a point when you were kind of um, going through your career, it may have been later stages or early stages, and you thought, Do you know, what? I could be a sales director? Honestly, it wasn't until fairly late, maybe two years before I took on my role, that I realized I could be a sales director. I was always pretty just focused on the next step. I didn't have a proper PDP. No one had talked to me about future growth. I think, you know, at that time um, in my career life cycle people were just happy to have you doing your job and delivering great results and if anything you were quite punished for for good performance um, and I think we've all been there or we've all seen it or experienced it and I think it's getting a lot better it certainly is in my business um, but you weren't recognized for it necessarily or put on a pedestal for it you were just sort of like okay keep going keep delivering so mm. because there was no conversations about it naturally I just assumed I probably wasn't ready or you know that, that I wasn't on the list for that sort of uh, role or acceleration. So yeah, about two years prior, I sort of went, oh, hang on, I could do that. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah so it was quite, so it was quite, it wasn't something you kind of set a goal in early career and said, right, I, I want to, I want to run this function one day, or that's a job I could be. It was actually when you got quite close to it, you, you, you started to think in more pragmatic terms, that's a job I could do. Yeah, and a conversation with my um, with my partner was probably the catalyst to it where he's like, well, why couldn't you do that role? Oh, you know, I couldn't do it because of this reason or this reason. He's like, no, explain to me the actual reason that you can't do it. What does that person who's currently in the role do that's astronomically different to what you could deliver? And it really got me thinking about it. And I had to go away and work at what the gaps that I thought there were. And there, there wasn't many. If anything, mm -hmm. it was just probably the leap of faith to put my hat in the ring and, and go for it. I find that quite interesting, Chrissy. I think a lot of people I talk to assume that um, people who reach your level uh, have kind of had that sole goal from an, you know, an early career stage. Yet when I look back, for instance, at the, one of the last interviews I did with Esme Borgelt from Kellogg's, you know, Esme had a thing, you know, it took a really challenging conversation from an HR person to kind of force her to say, yes, I want to be the MD. And and she wasn't able to say it out loud, you know, and didn't want to kind of really push herself and, and felt that some potentially somebody else's path. And it, and it sometimes takes that um, challenging conversation. I guess the point being, you know, don't assume that because, you know, you, you're, you're not this kind of single minded person wants to do that uh, role that you can't get there. You know, you do have to work collaboratively with other people to help you sometimes frame your decision making. 
Absolutely. And and you meet a variety of people, certainly in your role. And certainly, you know, when I talk to my team, there's some that are very much, yep, one day I'm going to be the big boss. And there's other people who are just very much like, I'm really happy with what I'm doing right now. And both of those could become sales directors. Completely, completely. Out of interest, there's a message in from um, Jeff in Japan here. Um, uh, Chris, who just says, best whiskey in the world, hashtag Nika. <laughs> <laughs> controversial, controversial. <laughs> All whiskeys are good, Jeff, so I will say that. Um, it's one good thing about our industry. And if you go, just, just a side note, you know, off on a tangent, um, if you go over to Scotland and Dufftown, which is where our distilleries are for Glenfiddich and Balvenie, all of the distillery or all of the distillers get together and have fish and chips in the town at lunch. Like there's, it's not competitive. We don't bag each other's people brands. And it, it makes me cringe if someone says something negative about a different brand. Like I wouldn't do that. So yeah. um, all whiskey is good whiskey, Jeff. And Nicker is also fantastic. Give you yeah, a plug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always come back. Um, so um, you, you, you get to the, the role of sales director, Chrissy, because you're good at what you do, you know, and, and uh, you, you can you obviously started to realize that and thought I could do this and went for it. And you, you know, you, you know, in the role, um, do you, does it stop there? Do you kind of think, um, okay, I've got to keep working my development. Uh, and, and if so, what, what do you keep working on? A hundred percent. I work every single day to be a better leader first and foremost. So that's something that I think constantly evolves. I'm certainly not perfect. Um, I've changed my, leadership style a thousand percent since being in this role and I think you have to keep changing it as the environment changes as cultural factors change things um, and looking back at myself five years ago I'm a completely not a different person I've, I'm still very authentic but I've certainly learned how to temper my style and maybe not be so direct in situations or you know how do I encourage people how do I deal with someone who's super emotional how do I deal with someone who's not emotional so from from that because you're primary role is getting results out of your team and not doing it yourself anymore so that's a whole learning in itself that if you're coming from a NAM role or um, you know any other function that's more task orientated you get very stuck into the detail and it's very hard to step away from being that functional expert and sticking your nose in everything and being really hands-on to letting your team make mistakes you know and that's something I have to deal with every day that I'm like no they should do it this way and I'm like oh no I've just got to let them go um, and my team, if they're listening or tune into this later or have a good chuckle at that, because, you know, constant feedback from them is what's making me better at making sure I, I keep improving on that. Interesting. And, and um, thinking of that whole development path, um, I'm always interested too in the, in, in the career conversation. And one of the reasons that I, I do this as a recruiter is that I, I, I want people to approach me when they're ready to have a great conversation about um, a move and, and not because they're feeling disgruntled or they're not sure they're getting what they want out of the current business. You know, that, that should be, um, uh, you know, they shouldn't get to that point. They should be really comfortable having really good career conversations within their organization. So their moves are, you know, well-planned and, and if, if it means exiting the business, it's for the right reasons. Now, um, talk to me a bit about, you know, in your world and, and, and in your team, um, how do you have a career conversation? Just take me through how it works with, with, with you, Christy, with, with yeah. as, as in with your team. With my team, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm very into PDPs. I think it's paramount to understand what your team wants to do because it's a motivational factor. So that, that for me, formulates part of what would be their reward mechanic. So what, what drives them is actually delivering on their role and um, how they go home and feel about their own delivery at the end of the week without necessarily needing a pat on the back from someone or an email out to the business saying this person's a star, but do they go home at the, every day, at the end of the day and feel rewarded? Um, so PDPs are a big part of that. And part of it's what do they need to develop on in their current role, but part of it's what's their long-term plan. Some people are great. Some people are planned out to their 50 and they know what they want to do and when they want to retire and so forth. And other people are just happy doing what they're doing. And some people also want to retire in your business so you know they might not necessarily want special things or treatment so it's always understanding what people want to do um, and having good conversations with the foundations on help how you can help them build from there uh, there shouldn't be any surprises I, I think if you've left it too late to have those conversations well it's never too late go have the conversations but there should never be a surprise with your leader that all of a sudden you're bored or that you want to leave it should almost be plain as day and you should be having that support from your leader from the start um, so for me, I schedule a monthly whip, which is just about them. 
how they're feeling about their performance, what they're wanting out of the business, what the business could be giving them um, and how they're going for those future aspirations as well. And I think you've got to keep that momentum up of having those whips because it is about them and you want your people to be happy, especially in my role where they're delivering your results. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, talking about your style and you mentioned before, um, you know, um, and this I'm relating to a question that's coming on the chat, Christy. Um, so, uh, talking about, say, um, Ben says, I appreciate your direct approach and whilst that can work. Um, and this, Ben has had a lot of feedback on, on, on him being direct over, over time and found it's been a great strength. From your perspective, has this always been part of who you are and how, how is it received generally? Yeah, it's, that's a great question, Ben, was it? Thank you for asking. Um, it, it can be received wonderfully from some people and terribly from others because it depends on their style, which is why I'm saying I constantly evolve. Mm. Um, it is a strength being direct. It absolutely is a strength because there's often no bullshit. Sorry, I'm going to swear. You can bleep it out later. Um, but, but there isn't, and that cuts through, and I think that resonates really well with some people. People like me love that. Just a quick chat. You know where you are. You know where you stand. Um, and my leader at the moment, Cole, he gave me some wonderful feedback, Ben, which which I'll give you is strengths are excellent until you overuse them. So be direct and make that part of who you are. And that's great. And that that ties into your authenticity and it's going to work for you for the most part. But it's when you overuse it and when you can't recognize when you overuse it. I recognize when I come across too direct in a conversation and I have to pull myself up. And it probably took me asking my team going, I recognize that I'm really direct guys, but why don't you pull me up when it's at that level where it's uncomfortable and it could be during the meeting, you could pull me up after if you're not comfortable to do that too. And having the trust, we've got a very good layer of trust in our business. People do that. They'll pull me up and go, hey, what you said there, that bothered me. Or, you know, um, <laughs> on the side, they'll pull me up and say, you know, maybe that comment in the meeting, that, that could have been offensive to someone. And that's helped me now have really good self-recognition. So you've got to keep working on it, Ben. Um, use it, but don't overuse it. Yeah, great advice. Um, it, it's interesting because sometimes the more um, perceived challenging conversations for those who are not direct can be tough in terms of how do I have that, you know, often thinking, how do I get into it? How do I navigate my way through it? An example would be um, if someone's feeling, for instance, underutilized in their role, that, that, that it's not going quite the way they they, they want it, but they don't. Know, they haven't got that style that says, "I'm just going to call it." You know, so they, they they they're not sure how to approach that conversation. What advice would you give for somebody who's in that place where kind of going, mm, "I want to do more. I don't know how to get into it. You know, what should I do about it?" Yeah, I think it's establishing for anything we do in business. It's establishing that trust, which I just talked about from the beginning. If you trust the intent that you can go to your leader or anyone in your business and have a conversation about where you're placed or how you're feeling, that immediately breaks down the barrier of discomfort um, so being being vulnerable with your leader and and being open is probably the first step in having productive conversations else you're never going to get there without the trust layer you can never get on to having a good level of conversation which will then lead on to obviously some conflict maybe you think you're doing really well and maybe your leader's going to pull you down and say actually there's some of these things that you could be doing differently um, and that could be a surprise but if you don't have the trust there you can't get on to the next layer um, as I said it shouldn't be a surprise though so the intent of having those regular whips would be the most important thing and critical thing so that you don't get a surprise by going, hey, I've sort of been doing the same thing for six months and I'm a bit bored now. It, mm -hmm. Almost they should be recognising, okay, you know, what are your KPIs and, okay, here's your career plan and, oh, geez, you're ticking all the buckets here. We're going to have to find you something different to do. And that's a good leader should be helping you with that too. Yeah, yeah. And let's dial up a little bit to, to one of the more, um, I guess, challenging conversations in theory that people have, which is around salary. So um, I, I often get oh, have some really interesting <laughs> conversations with candidates who come to me with a, just a bizarre view of what their salary should be, um, and and sometimes it's you know it's it, they're off the mark. It can be off the mark, low or high, right? And 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 and, and I get it. But um, so putting um, I guess the the start point to one side. Um, more generally, what advice would you give somebody about negotiating? A salary increase if they felt their salary wasn't right yeah it's <laughs> i'll be controversial again um no i find salary a really difficult one because how i manage it but also then how i experience like my personal sort of journey but then how i experience it with my team i'm just like oh maybe i should have been a little bit more brazen um so i would say one thing i talk about salary is it's important to get it right on the way into a business um, because for me, I just, you know, go back to salary being that hygiene factor of once you've ticked it, when you go into a business, 
you should definitely expect CPI. Um, but I generally don't expect anything beyond that unless my role's changed. And if my role's changed and the scope of it's changed, I think you have a fair right to ask for salary. Um, if, the, if the business has changed in a way that you've got extra channels coming in and you're delivering a lot more, I think you've got a right. Um, if there's economic conditional changes, like in the last two years, salaries have gone up probably higher than they ever have in this market, probably from a shorter talent pool as well, you might have a bit of a right to ask for an extra salary. Um, so I think it's really about why do you want the extra salary and putting that, if it's because your workload's increased and you honestly feel you deserve it, it's a great conversation and you can ladder that up in one of your whips, um, especially if it's around KPIs and look, here's all the extra things I'm having to add in and here's all my deliverables and demonstrating that you're actually adding value to a business through what you're doing. Um, but what I wouldn't recommend is you're getting married or you want a new car or you're having a baby and that's putting financial pressure on you and making your business accountable for your decisions. So yes, those things will put financial pressure on you and it might be a time in your life where you reflect on, I need more money, um, but you can't then just take that to your business with being your soul. I wanna buy a house and houses are expensive now, you owe me more money. You've got to play it into what are you delivering for the business and what are you doing differently from where you signed up for your salary to actually have the conversation, in my personal opinion. <laughs> I think that's pretty good advice uh, for um, everyone listening. Um, because what what I what I uh, what I want to, to to have the conversation with again, someone who approaches me who says, "I feel underpaid. I've seen the salaries in the market have changed, or look, I'm doing X, Y, and Z more in terms of my role, um, and it hasn't been recognised in terms of salary." My first question is, so how did that conversation go with your boss and the business? How did how did you step me through how that went? And three times out of four, they haven't had it. <laughs> They're having it with me, which is which is the wrong person to have it with. Um, now, have it with your business first because you don't know where you stand. And 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 actually, you know, it's it's it is a negotiation uh, in some extent. But um, good negotiations are being setting your goals and being well planned. And 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 there's going to be logic and rationale. It can't just be because some external factors happened. Um, so um, I'm, I'm with you there. And good. I think leaders are open to it. You know, the, the worst thing about being a leader is when, when you can't give people who you think are stars extra money because it won't fit into a band or something. Because just because you're a superstar might not necessarily mean that, you, you know, you get to be paid a little bit more. But yeah, demonstrate those deliverables and your leader will fight hard once you demonstrate them. And hopefully they already are if they can see that you are delivering. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Um, one of the things I find quite interesting in the in the um, in the current market is we we're doing a lot of work at AXR with um, fast growth um, accelerator businesses who who are going through you know rapid change. They're kind of agitating categories, and it's really cool actually. It's but it's a very different proposition from working in a mid size or a large tier one business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find it always interesting when I approach candidates about this, um, how open or otherwise some people are. What's your advice generally if someone's um, being approached for a move that, to, for instance, to a, a startup or an accelerator business that is completely different to what they're they're doing or what they thought their path would be, um, you know, how should they approach that conversation? I find um, those startup businesses or you know entrepreneurial sort of businesses amazing, and I personally would always look at it, and I'd recommend everyone looks at it. It really depends on where you're coming from as well. If you're coming from a very big FMCG company and you've got to make that transition into a startup, that could be really difficult. So I think you've got to work out, um, first of all, what your passion is for the product that they're offering. So, you know, if, if someone calls you and, and they're from a plant-based meats company, um, which is, you know, one of those areas that's probably in its startup phase at the moment, it has really, you know, has great potential for growth in the next 30 years but some of those businesses are going to fail. So it's like, do you have a passion for the product would be the first thing, you know, so you're actually going to put your heart and soul into it. So if that's a tick, yes. Um, do you like the people that you'd be working with? That's probably the second part of it. Um, and then you've got to look at the, the risk reward factor for yourself as well. There's a big portion of startups that fail um, and startups are chaotic. Um, I get to see it every day. My partner actually has his own startup so he's got two businesses, but one of them is in a startup phase. And it's crazy. You have to work with very different egos every day. Um, you know, the, the, the thing about the startups is a big business can come along and, and buy it in two seconds and you get gobbled up there or, um, or a big business could compete with it quite quickly as well. So it's almost like doing your own SWOT on what's the sustainability of that business. Because if you go across there and you risk everything, but then you don't have a job in six months, 
will the reward have been worth it for that six months? So I'd absolutely look at it, but I'd just make sure you're in the right sort of career life cycle and the right phase for yourself to take that role. Mm. But I love it. I think they're exciting. I work in a smaller business than a big business and and the difference is incredible um, at William Grant's compared to a Unilever or an Nestle. You are so hands-on and you literally have to be entrepreneurial every day. Um, And in a startup, it would be more chaotic than that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things I find interesting is um working with those type of businesses because often the question i have from a candidate is uh, and it's the right one is is uh, that job seems really interesting where does it take me what do i do next and, and and the kind of the clarity in that path is is um is not quite there often so you've got to it's more about well where's the business going to go next as opposed to your career path because um it's not obvious there's not this great structure that says i'm going to do this role then that role then that role then that role it, it, it actually depends how the business goes and, and you're probably going to wear four hats anyway not one <laughs> and, um, and it's just how those uh, um all those hats probably change and o- o- over time if the business is a success or not so there's a lot more risk um but there's a, a and a lot more fluidity and and so a lot of it's about mindset i'm prepared for that kind of environment um as opposed to the more formulaic kind of known world that they may be coming from i think yeah absolutely and i think that's that's the struggle with transition that they've got to balance up yeah yeah but i i love it i mean it's it's a lot of fun working uh, with large businesses and mid-size and um but it's a it's a heck of a lot of fun working with the small companies too but for sure. uh, Cool. Um, I, I want to spend quite a bit of time um, talking about, you know, life from the, I guess, sales director's chair. And I think we get some great feedback on, on, on um, uh, from the podcast and the live shows about it's really interesting getting views because for a lot of people in formative career stages, you know, um, there's lots of sales directors and on this, on, on who listen to the podcast, but there's a lot of NAMs and business managers and category managers, brand managers who are kind of saying, I think I know what, you know, Chrissy does, but I'm not entirely sure what she does. So we'll try and pick apart that a little bit. Um, for, first of all, how big a step is it or was it for you, you know, from being a senior salesperson in a function to running a function? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. And for me personally, it, it wasn't so bad. There was definitely learnings there. I'd say you have to caveat it between what your experience is with what you've done in all of the the mid sort of level roles. So there'll, there'll always be something to learn. You could have worked on Woolies and Coles and never worked on independence. So you're going to have to learn a whole new channel in your role. Um, you could be really good at understanding what the sales function does, but have never led the field or the customer marketing or the sales ops functions. Um, so for me, I had pretty broad exposure to all functions and then even over through to like supply and logistics from working in our travel retail channel to pretty much leading that marketing in that channel alone. So I was quite broad in my knowledge and understanding. So for me, the step wasn't too far other than leading quite a big team. So in our organization, we're pretty linear. So you don't go from a NAM role where you're managing five people in a NAM role, you're probably managing one at the best to then all of a sudden being a sales director where you might have 40 people in your function. Um, So that was probably the biggest step for me. But I think, you know, you've just got to look at broadening your experience the most you can in your current situation to be able to make that step as easy as possible to move into. Because if you're moving into that role and you don't have experience across four of those buckets, it's going to be more of a transition. But if you're fairly well across all of those buckets, then it's going to be as if you. That being said, and as I was talking about before, one of those biggest steps for me into the um, sales director role was getting out of the task and into the more strategic and into the more leadership position of it you don't need to do the task. You've actually got a team there to do that for you. So providing you've got that level of trust and providing you've got some capable people within your business, you've got time to learn from them anyway, and they should be the functional experts, not yourself. Yeah. Um, Two very good points there. I think the first one on, on, on breadth, now you'd sought out, you know, broadening experiences. So it felt that the move um, wasn't a colossal one. I think I think it sh- everyone should feel like that, you know. And um, I think most sales directors, you you you. I, I know if I, if I look at me as a recruiter, I recruit sales director roles, and and um, I'm unlikely to shortlist somebody who hasn't got career breadth. You know, um, I'm looking for yes, excellence in terms of managing customers, but I need to know that you get customer marketing or you understand category. You 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 um, you you've um, you've worked or you know, you understand. Um, sales ops or, or, or you know, um, 
um, periphery functions or support functions to to the business and 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 also you 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 kind of you work closely with finance you know show me that you've done that show me you understand the PL and and um so I think the linear path is is always going to be a tough one. Um, if you get there, the linear path, I think it's going to be a much more difficult step, um, and you're going to be trying to find up, find, you know, pick up all these technical skills while still doing your second point, which is shifting yourself from operational to strategic. Um, and I think doing both at the same time will be really, really difficult. So I think uh, get your get, get your experience right so that the um, you can spend all your kind of uh, your energy on 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 elevating that thought process to becoming more strategic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And and you know, whilst I said one of the points is you don't need to be the expert, you've got a team to do that. What if one of those team members becomes sick, and you have to step in there? So you know, having that broaden broaden skill set will certainly um, I think position you above other candidates when you're being looked at for a role. Yeah, yeah. What about KPIs? You know, um, do they change? You know, um, you don't have to tell me all your KPIs, but I'd love, <laughs> love, I'd love to know what what what's, what what measures success in in a sales director role. Yeah, I talked about um, leadership being a really primary part of being a sales director because you are literally relying on your team to deliver for you. Um, so that's a really big part of of it. So leadership and culture, um, but the biggest part of being a sales director is clearly in the delivery. Um, you can't walk away from that. I'd be, I wouldn't be talking truthfully if I said there was KPIs that were more important. It's the number, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's all the stuff that goes with it: working well, building a great culture, building for the long term, being sustainable. All of that's there, but also deliver the number. Else, you might have a bit of a hard time, um, yeah, maintaining your role. <laughs> <laughs> Not and, trying to be too direct there, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's interesting, actually, because. Um, I guess at every level on the sales function, the number is the most important thing. So that doesn't go away. You just got you've got a bigger number and, and yep. more factors to more consider accountability. In of, <laughs> yeah, in terms of how, how that influences. And um, one of the big influences, obviously, you know, is is customers. And and um, your role as a sales director, Christy, with customers must evolve and change. You know, talk us through that transition from you know being a sales director and, and your role with customers as as opposed to being, you know, a business manager or head of a channel or a national account manager. Yeah, I think um, it's it's great being the sales director and having chats to our customer because you you can be a little bit more strategic in top tops. You can be long long term and you can talk really candidly as well and you can have great conversations and you can have really difficult conversations. But I think with all your experience, you structure them in a way that they're beneficial for both parties. Uh, when you're a NAM or you know, more emerged into the channel, whether it's national business or, you know, ahead of a customer as well, you often get stuck into the task. And so you might be stuck in a terms negotiation or, you know, a, a disagreement over a pricing sort of strategy on a product. Um, and you, you get stuck there and it, it can sometimes become a bit bitter because you don't look above the water and around and see what else there is. So I think the role of the sales director obviously is to come in and try and bring it back to what the strategic plan is for both parties and how you can get that triple win. In the end, I always often find that you're squabbling over one thing that can seem really big to the people who are stuck in it, but actually it's not that difficult to overcome. Some of them are, I'm, I'm not gonna say there's not complexity in it, um, but typically we, you both want the same thing and it's just trying to find that midpoint. And sometimes that's the sales director's role to come in and break it down. And sometimes you have to go face up to the customer and say, you can't do it. And sometimes you have to go face in internally and say, we're going to have to bend a little bit more here and be a little bit more flexible. And that's your decision. And that's what you have to own. Um, and that is your full accountability because you can't ask your team to do that for you. You can't ask them to give more away than they're allowed to give. And you can't ask them to, ask the customer the same question back so you know i think that's that's the primary role of finding that midpoint uh, um you mentioned triple win there what did you mean by that yeah so triple win every business probably calls it something different um but for me it's it's the win between everyone ideally wants to get to the consumer in the end so it's got to be a win for the consumer for the customer and for the company and if you hit all of those three things then everyone should be happy if you're only going after what's good for the company you're not going to have a very good time with your customer. If you're mm. only going what's good for the customer, you're probably not going to have a fantastic time with your company. So yeah. it's got to be a balance across all three metrics. And that's what mm. I mean about balancing that out from the level where you're a sales director and can come in and look at that. Because sometimes when you're stuck in the task, it might be just about what's good for the consumer and the, and the customer, but forgetting what's good for the company or vice okay. versa. Okay. Do you find times where there's a problem or a challenge with a customer and, and, 
the natural thing is for you to step in as a sales director and fix it? Or do you, do you just sometimes push it back and say, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to re-equip you to, to take this on. This is not my job. You know, do you, do you find you kind of, yeah, you you don't always have to jump in and, and even though sometimes it's some, it perhaps is the fastest way to a solution. Yeah, one, 100% I shouldn't always jump in. Um, and I think that's one of the things I said I was always uh, working on to let my team, we've got a, what we call a freedom, a freedom to win mantra at William Grant and Sons. So it's a big, you know, you've got the freedom to go out there and do things yourself. And we live by that. And with that means that there's a freedom to fail as well. And we won't give you crap if you fail. That's okay. Because when you fail, it should be a lesson that you can share with the wider business and they go, okay, right. well, we won't do that again. So, you know, without failing, you're not probably getting many learnings. So we want to fail as well. Um, so yes, letting your team do it and pushing back as much as you can, but to a point where it doesn't become a business risk. Um, some of my best learnings have been with one of my biggest customers and I love catching up with them. And I'll, you know, when I've had to step in, I've gone, okay, you know, can you help me out here? Or, you know, this is what my team's trying to achieve and this is the barrier we're getting with your team. From your perspective, what do we need to do? And they're like, you know, they're very much like, well, I wouldn't step on my team's toes, but here's the advice I'd be giving you of what you could come back with. So that's yeah. a good learning for me too, that I shouldn't be going and messing with my team too much too. It's about giving them the advice of what they could go back with. That's, that's really interesting. Great. Um, now, one of the um, uh, areas I've, I've talked to a few times on the, on the podcast, Christy, is, is how much the role of sales has evolved. Um, now, it's great talking to you as a female leader in the liquor industry. There's not many of you running sales functions in, in liquor. Are you, are you the only one or is there another one or two? Uh, I'm pretty sure Sarah Parks has just taken on a sales director role. So she'd be great for you uh, in an upcoming session over at Treasury. Um, absolute star. So, but there's not many. I think we've had Rose Scott and obviously Evelyn over at Brown Foreman as a GM as well. So um, in the past few years, there's been more. Um, sorry, there's, there's, there's been a couple, but yeah, it's, it's not like a 50-50 mix at all. So it's definitely right. under underdone in our and, industry okay and if i look at the um the, i guess the, the 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 more traditional fmcg um sector um I, and i've worked very hard to make sure i try and get a gender balance on on this program of 30 sessions and i reckon probably half have been female leaders which is really good but uh, um, but if if you know if liquor um you're the first female leader we've had on. Um, we've had we've female marketing leaders on, but uh, um, you know, wh why do you think liquor is slightly further behind? Uh, I think there's one a gap in how we bring people into the liquor industry. I'm not sure if it's a bit scary or when you're 18 working with alcohols, not something you do. So I'd say the average age of our employees might start a little bit older. So if those entry level roles, you're certainly right. There's more in HR and in um, finance and in marketing and customer marketing. There's far less in sales. I think there's a few reasons. I think historically it might not have been the most female friendly place walking into pubs and selling kegs of beer and, you know, and, and some of the roles going out and seeing bars at night for those entry level roles. So that, that could be a bit daunting to people. Um, lifestyle probably plays a part of it as well. It's, it's less family friendly if you're, if you're wanting to do some home stuff as well and have kids and so forth, that could have been a barrier in the past. Um, and then just the sentiment around females in liquor, I think we were quite old school for a long time. And I'm sure there's still some of that floating around in FMCG um, in some channels, but certainly in liquor, um, and in my experience, it, it's been a bit of a boys club. Um, that's okay for my personality style, but it's certainly probably not okay for others. Now, it has evolved greatly. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll give a big heads up to, to everyone out there that don't be scared of joining Liquor Company and a big congratulations to all of the leaders, male and female in our liquor industry at the moment, for doing a wonderful job and turning it around and, you know, a good body in the Drinks Association and so forth that really focus on gender equality and, and trying to get the right people in. Not just gender now, we're obviously working on more than that, but gender is a part of it as well. Yeah, I've noticed the work that group's done, actually. They've, their profile's gone through the roof in the last year. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, was it... And Simon Durrant at Campari seems to spearhead a lot of that in the last year. I think he's handed it on now. But uh, Yeah, so you've got uh, Chris coming on from Diageo and Chris Diageo, is now yeah. leading the diversity yeah. agenda for it. So, um, yeah, that's going to be really exciting because I think it's the big businesses that can help the most in getting uh, the right gender balance in. And I've talked about this before that you need to get those entry-level roles filled because if not, you've got this whole middle section where you can't promote from. Mm. So, you know, we've got to start bringing them in. It, it is working, but yeah, sales is that one that I still think we need to work on a little bit more. 
on on kind of entry level roles and uh, and graduates, I have a sense if this was my son just graduated and he he'll look at FMCG and was curious. Uh, uh, I find it quite interesting. Through no encouragement, money's gone into recruitment, but there we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he he had a good look at FMCG and and and. Um, what he found was not that many grad programs uh, that compared to perhaps when, when, when I did a grad program in FMCG way back, um, you know, what, what are we going to do? How do we actually encourage people in? Yeah, I think there's, there's two things I'll touch on there. One is the need for grad programs, and I think they should be around. Um, I think they're great. I think you can attract really good talent. Um, and the way grad programs have been run in the past is you were, you were taking the top talent pool of, of who was applying as well. So you're getting great people to move through your business, exposed to different parts of it, and promote them up accordingly. Um, and I know, you know, the Nestle's and Unilever's of the world, the bigger companies, they could do that. So I would encourage them to get back to it. That being said, as someone who didn't go to uni straight after, to school I found it infuriating that grads would come in and move around over the top of me and so forth um, when I was delivering in my role and I didn't get that opportunity so one thing I do encourage businesses to do for entry-level roles particularly is you don't need to go to university to be a sales representative or to to you know join marketing in an entry-level position you simply don't those in my opinion um, and having done my MBA since I, I don't think that those those courses would have set me up for any more success that I couldn't have got as an on-the-job training opportunity. Um, certainly, it could have rounded out my understanding of business as, as an entity or marketing as an entity, um, but I don't necessarily think you need to say you need six years or you need a graduate experience to come into certain roles. So it's a, it's a balance, right? I want grad programs, but I also want people looking at entry-level roles of not only having to be grads. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I completely agree. Um, but it's actually it's that it's that this it's almost like um, how do we promote the sector whether it's liquor or FMCG so whether you're a graduate or a young young person you know that actually this is a, this is a viable choice there's, there's roles for you to do we we want you in here because if we don't then we do store up the issue of um, you know when you get to right now we've got a, a very hot talent marketplace you know. Um, Goodness, if you're a national cap manager at the moment, you know, give me a call. <laughs> There's plenty yeah. of them here. <laughs> but, uh, um, my team, please do not call Mike. <laughs> apart from, apart from you know, being Chris's team. Um, so but there's plenty of roles out there, and a lot of that is demand and supply. You know, that there's just not the same demand coming through. You know, and I think a lot of it that is to do with the, the fewer people entering the industry. So great if you're in, but um, and the, the the career paths are fantastic as we're highlighting in this program, but we just need to get more people um, in, at the, in at the base level. And the industry is fantastic. Anyone who's on this call from a liquor company would laugh um, because you don't want to leave. It's amazing. Uh, and I'm so happy. My dad was actually the one that was constantly berating me to get into the liquor industry um, because he worked in the liquor industry for a long time as well. Um, and I didn't think about it. And then when I got in, I was like, oh, this is what he meant. It's so much fun. The brands are amazing. Um, and you have so much fun. So <laughs> like, I, I don't understand what the barrier would really be at the moment to come yeah. in. So if we bring them in and we actually train them up and we take them through, um, and I think most businesses are really focusing on that internal development, then we will be in a better position. Because mm. I think the reality of um, the role and the industry and the career path you can have um, is is developing every, every year and the, the, the diversity of role particularly in sales is, is phenomenal what we're asking all sales people now um is so different to five ten years ago you'll see that in your in, in your career i think so with a with a more sales um a diverse sales function we need more diversity of people in that function in order in order to perform yeah well we we talk about it all the time don't we mike 50 percent of the people who drink alcohol for instance in our in our industry are females so, uh, and 50% of our buyers, maybe more now would be females. So <laughs> it's, it's great to have the right mix of people in there, having the right conversations within your business. So you're not only focusing on one side of it. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Chrissy, we're actually at time. That's, uh, that's us up to 45 minutes. It goes very quickly. Um, Brilliant. Tremendous, uh, tremendous conversation. Um, um, some great points uh, that we got into through there. I, I, that last conversation on career paths, diversity evolution of the function and 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 um you know you you there as a uh is a female sales director in, in liquor is a great example and and um you know i um 
would implore anybody who's on the call who who wants to perhaps uh, pick up the Christie offline. Um, I know we've talked about this before. You'd be more than happy to to accept a LinkedIn request or absolutely have, have a virtual coffee, whatever the the the, the case may be. So uh, um, appreciate you, you you offering that, Christy. Um, so thank you so much for um, sharing your journey and and um, in particular talking about the kind of your role and and um, you know your approach and your style and and you know some great advice and everything from um, you know how to negotiate your salary which was which was gold um, <laughs> to, through, through to through to diversity in the functions so we got through I got through a lot there um, now as a reminder. Um, Today's session with Christy will be in the podcast. You're featuring Sales and Marketing next Thursday. Um, download and subscribe for your favorite podcast provider. Um, if you review us, that would be great as well. And rank us, it just helps others find the podcast. Um, the next session is with um, uh, the Marketing Director uh, Incubator, which is on September the 2nd with Tamara Howe. Um, GM of uh, Kellogg's New Zealand. Um, Tamara's an ex CMO uh, who's moved into the GM role. So it'd be great to get her perspective. And after Tamara, we're back with another sales director in Gabeda on September the 16th. We've got a unique uh, double act, actually. We've got um, dual sales directors for Blackmore's, uh, Dave Tuffin and Craig Wagner. So uh, uh, looking forward to having the, the guys on there. And, and that's been a really interesting business journey, too. So, uh, Christy, once again, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. It's been awesome. Um, and uh, everybody have a great Thursday and we'll uh, stay safe and we'll, 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 we'll talk again in a couple of weeks time.